Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is a frontline update for the Ukraine war for the 14th of February, 2023. Yes, it is Valentine's Day and yes, I've got something better to be doing than this, surely. Um, uh, I'd better write my card. Uh, if you haven't done all so already, please go and do so. Don't get yourself in trouble watching me, but actually watch this first and then go and give your box of hot check chocolates away. Anyway, war, Europe on the borders of Europe, very problematic, what's been going on on the front lines. Well, actually, not a great amount of news from the last 24 hours, but you know me, I'll manage to spin it out. Uh, this, I always make a point of trying to establish what's going on with, the, with regards to the, the losses. It's very difficult to find out what's going on with the Ukrainian losses. They're very tight about that. With Russian losses, they produce these figures every day, and, and I look to try and evidence that and argue back to the pro-Russians in the threads, you know, you are denying this, but here's all the evidence. Well, here's another piece of evidence about the the massive losses in uh, Vukladar. So Vladimir Putin has continued to publicly stand by the Russian Ministry of Defense as Russian forces continue to suffer catastrophic casualties around Vukladar. He wouldn't need to say stuff like this unless there was a problem there. So Putin commented on Russia's state TV show, uh, show recorded on February the 9th and broadcast on the 12th that the Russian naval infantry is working as it should right now and that the Pacific and Northern fleets are heroically fighting. Putin likely deliberately play, praised his Pacific and Northern fleets against a backdrop of highly public and substantial losses to mechanised elements of the 155th uh, Naval Infantry Brigade of the Pacific Fleet in their assault on Vukladar. The Russian MOD has been silent regarding Russian losses there, and Putin's comments follow Russian Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu's uh, statement on February the 7th that Russian forces are successfully developing an offensive in Vukladar, which is, of course, complete nonsense. Uh, Putin is likely deliberately doubling down on the Russian MBD's extremely overly optimistic description of the Vukladar front line to sustain the narrative of an, of an imminent and sweeping major Russian offensive in Donetsk or Blast. Putin is also likely refraining from siding with critical mill bloggers who have been increasingly accusing the Russian MOD and military command of failing to learn from their previous mistakes when conducting mechanised drives. Russian military has ha, has also been accumulating in Mariupol, so these indicators could suggest that the forces are pr preparing for some kind of commitment to Vukladar. Um, but on the flip side of that, the Russian military's use of mobilised personnel as replacements in battle damaged units is unlikely to generate sufficient offensive capabilities for a large scale and rapid mechanised advance. All these different claims at the moment as to what is going on with regard to whether there is going to be a big advance or not, or big offensive or not in, uh, well, at any one place uh, around the front lines. Uh, we have had announcements from the Ukrainian intelligence that actually uh, things aren't looking as good for the Russians as maybe they say. So they had originally said there's going to be a huge offensive. Then the Ukrainian intelligence said, we don't actually think they've got the capacity for a huge offensive. However, then today, uh, Sergei Khaidai has said um, in his daily update that uh, we should expect massive attacks by the Russian Russians in the Luhansk region uh, and you know we are seeing definitely build up of troops in the Luhansk re region we are seeing offensives in this northeastern sector Kupiansk is pretty hot uh, around Kremina there's a lot of activity Bilirikva just down south of there and then towards Seversk and then you've got of course Bakhmut um, so lots of activity uh, and there could be a massive attack but it's whether that is as, as huge as the, uh, such an offensive should be, given it's the second greatest army in the world, supposedly. Uh, Tendar is a little sort of tongue-in-cheek. Well, not tongue-in-cheek. This is a perfectly valid point. If, so if I was to summarise all the Russian activities of the last four weeks, I come to the following numbers of conquered villages in the following areas from north to south. Kupiansk, one. Svatva, zero. Kremina, zero to one. Maybe Dobrova. Bakhmut, six. Abdivka, zero. Marienka, zero. Vukladar, zero. Orkhiv, zero. Kamianska, zero. There you go. Uh, yeah, it, it, perspective. The point of saying that is, given all this talk about massive Russian offensives and given the last really month of activity, Russia has achieved pretty much nothing uh, at the moment. Uh, meanwhile, the Ukrainians are building up their offensive capabilities for a counterattack. They are training, they're getting kit in. Uh, is is there an asymmetry there? Will Russia get any kind of kit to be able to 
produce uh, an offensive that's meaningful of their own. Or if we go to the northeastern uh, sector and we go to Kupiansk area, Kupiansk under you know quite a bit of artillery fire, but there's you know not a lot to report particularly from here. Rebar says you know very little about the Starobilsk direction as they call it. Positional battles and artillery duels continue along the entire front line. Situation is complicated by extensive mining, um, which is what I've been talking about this last week. The enemy is forming reserves in Lipchanivka to reinforce its capabilities in the Kupiansk and Liman directions. Uh, Poulet Valon has pretty much the same map uh, as we've seen the last few days. They are pushing in Shranikivka uh, and to uh, around Liman Pershi and possibly around Sinkivka as well. Uh, Defmon says the Ukrainians repulsed an attack by the 138th um, rifle brigade in the area of Shranikivka. You, Russians are trying to push the Ukrainians out of the salient al along the Oskil River north to Kupiansk. So basically, this area here, that's what he means, this this area here, between the Oskil River the, and the Russian front line, you've got this kind of group of, of Ukrainian defenders, uh, and they are being sort of pummeled there. We're keeping the Ukrainian bridgehead in artillery range is essential for Russians to prevent the AFU from developing an offensive in this area. Uh, I don't know whether Ukrainians have that in mind, an offensive at some point, but this looks to be one of the areas of Russian offensives at the moment. Um, and uh, other than that, not really much detail. The ISW says, if we go down, to what they say about this area. Russian ground attacks near Hiranikivka. Uh, yesterday, Russian mill bloggers claimed that Russian forces have advanced up to five kilometers in unspecified areas in the Kupiansk direction and have made marginal territorial gains near Hiranikivka, Dvorichny, uh, Sinkivka, and Liman Pershi. A Russian mill blogger. So, um, sorry, that, that will do for there. So, no change as far as my mapping is concerned here. There are claims that Russians have advanced, as according to the Russians. It's not really confirmed anywhere and fairly unspecified, so we'll leave it at that. But things will be sort of fairly um, tasty around that area. Then we come down to um, Kuzumivka area. Is there, there's still obviously, oops, I've gone past it. Where do we have Svatova here? Kuzumivka. No news out there, but we have. Uh, heard the ISW mentions Kislivka again, and is it, uh, yeah, uh, Kotelia Rivka. So that's the first time I've heard these two settlements being mentioned for some time. So there's fighting around there. Okay, as we come further down south to, uh, to Kremina, again, not a huge amount of detail coming out uh, north of Kremina. Although, as War Monitor says here, assault attempts are also being made west of Svatova and Kremlin, uh, uh, Kremlin front line in several places. Heavy fighting continues. Really, the details more about south of Kremlin. So Russian forces have launched several new assault attempts, mainly towards heavily defended forested areas west of Kremlin. Heavy fighting continues. They also attempt to bypass positions from the north towards Nevsky so far uh, unsuccessfully. So if we look in the Kremlin area here, so here's Kremlin, you've got the Serebriansky Forest uh, south. ISW reports that there were attacks from Dubrova towards Torska, uh, towards uh, Zarichna even, um, and that the Spetsnaz, the Russian Special Forces, were correcting fire, artillery fire, I think, against um, Torska as well. Uh, yep, so position in the Torska area, so yeah. Uh, fight, you know, pressure on Torska. All all around here, there will be fighting. Um, but it certainly seems in a forested area that most of the fighting is taking place. Uh, unspecified sort of kilometer gain for the Russians in this area, as according to some Russian sources. Uh, Rebar says uh, not really, not a lot actually. So Luhansk People's Republic Ukrainian formations fired high Mars rockets to residential buildings, civilian structure in the town of Stakhanov, and that's basically all they say about about that that line there so that's fascinating um poulet volon's map uh doesn't look oh no it doesn't even do sorry it doesn't do a map of the kremna uh, svatova area uh so again you know that tells you that it's kind of fairly stable Defmon says uh, the Ukrainians repulsed attacks in the area of Kremlin and Bilirivka continued efforts from the Russians to improve their positions for an offensive uh, towards Liman and Siversk. So just to remind you where these places are, uh, we have um, Kremlin here and they are attacking Bilirivka down south. Down, this is a forest area there. 
uh, towards Siversk. That is uh, super important for them. And they also want Liman, uh, which was famously encircled by the Ukrainians in the, after their lightning counterattack and the Russians pulled out and back. Uh, so they would like to, I think, push the Ukrainians at least to this Oskil River line here as it joins the Sversky Donetsk uh, coming down there. So all of this area, really, the Russians will want to be taking uh, as a bare minimum, I would have thought, and Sversk as well, down to the south. Um, but again, you know, slow movement, it has to be said. Um and uh, the Russian MOD statement from today gives an indication the air you still being in the area of Dubrova, Kuzmyrna and Kremlina. Uh, so it, it appears that, yeah, not, not a, a massive movement for them. Lots of fighting in the forest. No report says the fighting continues fiercely around Kremlina. There is now also visual evidence of Russian VDV, so airborne units trying to force breakthroughs. It looks rather clumsy, but the numbers that Russian throws at it cause serious pressure. Uh, and this is a video that's been sort of doing the rounds of the Russian VDV firing. But uh, actually, if you look at the video, it's, some of these, they're just pointing their, their, it's not even proper suppressive fire. They're literally firing up into the trees sometimes. Uh, like that sort of suppressive fire. And then this guy, I don't know, we've already misses it, missed it. You know, he, he actually ducks back down and still ends up firing up into the trees. Just, yeah, anyway, there you go. It's the... Uh, yeah, that, that is a video of them fighting in the forest. So there's um, intense fighting going on in the forest area, uh, and it seems to be a lot of uh, a lot of concentration on Bilirivka from the, from the Russians. Because as I keep saying, you know, Bilirivka is is a bit of a key towards getting Seversk. Obviously, you know, the next stop Seversk there, and this is holding out there. Uh, Bilirivka it's been flattened, but but I think the geography allows Ukraine to uh, have a little bit of sort of an advantage there perhaps um anyway as we come down to uh, Bakhmut we have all the details on Bakhmut so as we come to look at the Bakhmut area uh, which you will be fairly familiar with now we have the Bakhmut main town being encircled we have this fighting going on to the north as they try to pu push up towards Seversk from the Fedorovka Rosalivka area there is basically repulse fighting or there's fighting all over the so every word that you can see on the front line every name there they'll be fighting around there Vedyukivka, Fedorivka, Rosalivka um, and then obviously Krasnohora area so Krasnohora is definitely being being taken there's plenty of video footage now to suggest that is the case so video footage of all over uh, Wagner all over Krasnohora because Cher, Cher, uh, um What's his name? Cherovati did say yesterday, weirdly, that they're still fighting in Krasnohora, but actually pro-Ukrainian sources are like, no, there's not. Uh, literally, we got all the geolocated footage you need to say that Russia have taken that. But what's interesting, so Ukrainian Eastern Group of Forces spokesperson Cherovati did say on February the 12th, so again, this is like two days back now, that the forces engage in 19 combat clashes over the course of the day and fighting occurring here, there and everywhere. Now, that's interesting because previously he had said, I think we'd even had in the 40s, certainly in the 30s. In other words, if he's reporting fewer clashes, I don't know if that says that, that it's sort of calming down a little bit in the Bakhmut area, but, you know, that's just going on those numbers he, he, he presents there. But it's certainly, the last couple of days has seemed a little bit quieter. I've not been hearing anything about the eastern side of um, Bakhmut really uh, and very quiet around the Opitni area so you know it, it could well be that that number does represent some kind of of calming um, and this is also interesting the Russian MOD confirmed the capture of Krasnohora and stated that volunteers of assault detachments took the settlement they are uh, as I reported yesterday they are now refusing to mention Wagner or um, Prigozhin in their in any sort of State, I don't think Russian state television is even allowed to mention them. Uh, I think there's a kind of ruling now. So, yeah, you, that's why you get these kind of euphemisms. Uh, Rebar, very, very little report. In fact, Rebar's reporting yesterday is very skimpy on everything. Uh, Solidar direction, following the liberation of Krasnohora, Wagner assault units continue to clear the area and advance near Paris Kavivka to the southwest of Bakhmut. Wagner entered Budenivka, destroying a stronghold and advancing through Mariupolsky Cemetery. Uh, we'll come on to that. Um, uh, Poulet-Voulon's map here shows 
pretty much the same sort of uh, mapping as yesterday that there's pushing towards this uh, highway near Paraskovivka to the uh, west of Paraskovivka but they Pule Volon doesn't have um, them reaching the highway there uh, no report says uh, north of Bakhmut um, Krasnohora is obviously you know taken uh, the assault from two sides on Paraskovivka is ongoing uh, and uh, let's go to see what Defmon says. So he talks about that M03 road. I think the positions along the M03 are very hard for the Russians to, uh, sorry, for the Ukrainians to hold. And the Russians, uh, sorry, are very hard to hold for Russia and even harder to supply. So that's interesting. So that's um, I don't, M03, is that, let's have a look. Yes, so that is this one here. Uh, coming in this e40 on on the google maps but that's the m03 so he's saying that it's difficult for them to hold pule volon has the russians further back there uh, as they're trying to sort of move on bakivka but paraskovivka is holding out and the question is how long do they hold out how long should they hold out but someone's saying yes in the threads actually by the ukrainians being there it enables their mortar teams to remain there and to, to be able to hit all places around here. So although it's very risky sitting in that kind of little salient where they can be cut off, they can also hit hit the Russians in, in a number of areas. And I guess the likewise, you know, this area for the Russians is quite vulnerable because actually they are surrounded by Ukrainians. So it's not it's not always that, you know, making these bridgeheads is a, is a good thing because, you know, you are vulnerable from multiple sides. But yes, yeah, certainly fighting it in Paraskovivka is uh, pretty intense, as you can imagine. Uh, and then as we uh, come down to, uh, let's have a look, to the south, what uh, Reba was saying is that the cemetery, I, I've not changed my map here, but Reba has the Russians, just to repeat, um, Wagner entered Budanivka, destroying a stronghold. Again, that could just mean like a house, like or or like a shed where whatever you know that that's not is always kind of vague. Like firing position and stronghold are words that Reba uses a lot, and and you don't really know exactly what that is. Or it could likewise also be like a really strong fortified building that has you know loads of. Ukrainian troops and ammunition, all sorts. You know, it, it depends. Um, and advancing through Mariupolska Cemetery. Uh, so they, they, uh, Rebar has the Russians advancing through here. I've got no confirmation of that from anywhere else. So I'm just going to keep it as it is. But it could well be that this might be an area that the Russians are um, advancing in. And then as we come down to this Ivaniska area, uh, interesting that the Ukrainians may well have pushed the Russians back. So Global War Monitor states that Ukraine has pushed Russia back from the T0504 road near Vinivska, where we had a bridge being blown up the other day, by 1.7 kilometers. This is good if Ukraine can push uh, back to Klitschivka, as it would help prevent the encirclement of Bakhmut. Absolutely. I just haven't heard much of this from anywhere else, other than it, vague comments you know, from no report saying it's it's looking better in the south. Uh, Defmon says... Uh, it does not look like the Russian manage, Russia manages to break through the Ukrainian defensives around defenses around Ivaniska, and uh, no report says as for Bakhmut, the city is now hermetically sealed. Russian sources claim a breach around the cemetery southwest of the city. Are there so there is that claim, but then that could be referring to Reba. As far as I know, the situation there has not changed, but it is difficult. The situation has slightly improved southwest of Ivaniska near the forest. So going back to this. Uh, map from global war Mon monitor there are, there are indicate indications that here this is a forested area there southwest of Ivaniska. Uh, it, it could be that the russians have been pushed back from the road indeed as that map suggests by 1.7 kilometers which is you know fairly useful amount of uh a distance really um so there's 1.7 kilometers it could be that, that the Russians are now back there, and, and that looks likely given there's a couple of sources suggesting that. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave my map set as, uh, as it is there, which is pretty confusing looking there, and say that it is fairly stable in, in Bakhmut, which is good news for the Ukrainians rather than for the Russians. That kind of stability allows Ukraine to fix the Russians in place, to attrit the forces, 
uh, and to, to hold out for as long as possible while the the because the Ukrainians are playing for time here to some degree. They're waiting for their forces to get trained up, waiting for the Western uh, equipment to come in and then have their counter offensive. And if they can fix the Russians here for as long as possible in that calculation of of troops being lost for either side, uh, it, it, it is it is worthwhile, it appears, for the Ukrainians to do so. OK, let's move uh, down to Avdivka. My usual Colombo moment, just want to show you Pule Valon's uh, Bakhmut map to, towards the south, because actually it's got a rare yellow arrow on uh, for this kind of period of Russian offensive. Uh, and that also indicates that the Ukrainians have pushed the Russians back in that forested area to the southwest of Ivaniska. So it, I will probably adapt my maps because there's, there's just quite a few sources showing that. Um, and then, uh, as I said, we come out uh, to Avdivka. Uh, or I've already done that here, actually, because uh, I've been messing around behind the scenes. So Avdivka has not shown, there's not been too much activity. So just to remind you where Avdivka is. So we've got Bakhmut here. We come down the Donetsk front line, past Tourette's, past New York. Uh, and we hit Avdivka, which is in, partially encircled in the same way that Bakhmut is. But there's this uh, town just north there called Nova Bakhmutivka. And Novobakhmutivka, I had under Ukrainian control actually completely, uh, but it turns out, well, at least according to Syriac maps, that it, it appears that it was under partially under Russian control, half and half. I didn't realise that, or at least the, my mapping hadn't reflected that. Uh, but according to Syriac maps, pro -Ru pro Russian mapper. They say that the Russians have advanced in Nova Bakhmutivka and now control almost all of it. Uh, situation north of Edivka, the Russian army and DPR forces restarted advances in Nova Bakhmutivka town. Most of the urban area is already under control of Russians, while the western farms are still under the control of the Ukrainian army. So uh, that um, is uh, that is certainly uh, an interesting bit of movement there that I hadn't really been on top of previously. I'll keep an eye on that from now on. But other than that, there's just footage of trenches being, um, t uh, you know, artillery shelled by the Russians here that you've got Ukrainian trenches, you know, pretty much close to Vodjani, just north of Vodjani in this area. Uh, and the Russians are trying to push towards Shiverny to continue their um, encirclement, but not a lot of success there. There's activity around Novelsky, which is uh, just here. There's lots of uh, entrenchments in Novelsky. So Novelsky is is um, under quite a lot of pressure because it allows the Russians or would allow the Russians to flank Pervomysky, which is this long, thin settlement that creates a, a difficulty for the Russians to encircle. And the same can be said for Marienka. That's what I was talking about Marienka yesterday. It, the same situation with a long thin settlement and uh, that those are difficult settlements for the russians to take head on uh, so they need to encircle them but it's difficult to do so because even though these places look like open fields they end up being quite difficult because defenses have been built in there over the years rebels one of the few sources that explicitly mem mentions marinka fighting continues in marinka west of Druzba avenue russian artillery is striking ukrainian supply routes the enemy indiscriminately shelled the donetsk area okay it goes on to talk about other things so that talks about fighting to the west of Drewsbit Avenue. So if we um, zoom in, we've got Drewsbit Avenue all the way down there. To the west could just mean down in this southwest area rather than up here. I'm not aware that they've moved particularly further on, the Russians, and they do have a foothold west of the Drewsbit Avenue. Yesterday, I talked about how uh, Syriac Maps mentioned geolocated footage of, of Russian advances, and they showed that as being this police station here. Uh, so and that's the same line I've had for a, well over a month, I think. So it really didn't show advances. Uh, anyway, there you go. Uh, as we move on down, Pobjeda, repulse attacks around there. We move on to Nova Mikhailivka and Vukladar, and we'll get a handle on what's happening in Vukladar. So. No reports says, despite the fact that the Ukrainian stand, U Ukraine stands firm in Vukladar, this picture sounded to me deeply. This is a very sad picture. If you, if you think that was once obviously you know, a little bustling town, that represents massive shelling in those datches there. And it is uh, also a case probably of thermobaric munitions being used, all the black and scorched soil and these apartment blocks that have just been absolutely 
you know, well, they haven't been absolutely devastated. I mean, they're unusable as apartment blocks ever again, but they've that they've actually stood fairly firm, which means that the Ukraine can continue to use them um, for positions of heightened line of sight. And that's very useful for them in this area, because as I keep mentioning, this is on higher ground, Vukladar, and they can see down to Pavlivka um, and Mikilska. If you, if you look at the buildings in Marienka, they have basically been reduced to rubble, whereas these haven't. These have all these kind of uh, old school cement apartment blocks that are obviously fairly well reinforced, and they have stood the test of, of time and war and are still standing fairly strong. So that's been really useful for the uh, Ukrainians. Tatrugami, just a brief update, uh, because it seems to have calmed down a little bit in Vukladar. The enemy continues occasional assaults on the Vukladar area with no results. Reinforcements mostly comprised of mobilized continue to arrive in the area. The information about enemy successes west of Vukladar is false. And this is a claim that uh, the Russians have put out that they've made uh, gains west of Vukladar. Uh, there are rumours that Russia has made territorial gains around Vukladar. This is incorrect, says no reports pro-Ukrainian pro source. Also, there is no talk of a renewed Russian assault yet in, to Vukladar after the earlier disgrace. However, there is renewed troop build-up reported by multiple sources. There was a high Mars hit in the area that took out um, a commander. And this is from Alexander Khodorkovsky, who's a, a Russian source. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, pretty significant there the high mods are still operational um in the in the area and the just to go to isw uh, see what they have to say um uh so it, it says here a uh, geolocated footage um on february 12th posted shows russian tanks hitting mines east of Vukodar, which i showed you some of them uh no confirmed attacks from the general staff yesterday but i think there were skirmishes Commander of the DNR Vostok, this is what Defmon was referring to, Battalion Alexander Khodorkovsky, claimed on February the 13th that a Ukrainian high Mars strike uh, on here of Vostok headquarters, killing the headquarters commander, but the Russian command and control in the Vukhodar area will not be impacted by the strike because of duplicated communication channels. But that's still obviously going to be a bit of, of a problem. Okay, in the Vukhodar area, this is Poulet Volant's map there, Pavlivka pushes from sort of Pavlivka to the west of um, Vukhodar. So the, there, are, there are some Russian claims that there have been some successes around there, but they've been flatly denied by the Ukrainians. And then uh, some sort of skirmishes going to the south of Hulaipol, uh, near a place called Zahirna, um, as we come further along to the west from Vukladar. So that comes all the way over to here. And um, yeah, Hulaipol there. So possibly around the Drozdyanka uh, and uh, front around there, some skirmishing. So there is fighting on the Zaporizhia uh, front line in certain areas. There is there are defences still being built in the uh, in the Zaporizhia and Kherson Oblast. I'm just going to bring you down to Kherson to just talk a little bit about what uh, the ISW say. I'll leave the map on though uh, because I think it's quite uh, interesting um, synopsis. So Russian forces did not conduct offensive operations in Kherson or Mykolaiv oblasts between the 12th and 13th, but Humenyuk, the spokesperson, stated on the 12th that Russian forces are not deploying military equipment or personnel to Kherson that would threaten Ukrainian positions on the West Bank. Humenyuk added that Russian forces have recently conducted a troop rotation on the Kinburn Spit, Mykolaiv oblast, and noted that Russian forces are concentrated at the base of the spit to avoid Ukrainian artillery fire on narrower areas so they appear to be uh, like accumulating here but just out of a uh, ukrainian artillery or, or or some such scenario the ukrainian general staff reported that russia deployed 200 rosgvardia there's a that's like their riot police servicemen to lazern uh, which is southwest of um uh so Zal lazern is there right on the coast uh and that is uh, to strengthen counter subversive measures in the east bank of the Kherson Oblast. So there's obviously quite a lot of partisan activities sort of brewing up around here, and they they put 200 riot police sort of in 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 that uh, settlement to to help uh, curtail that activity. 
Russian forces continue to shell Kherson, obviously. Russian sources reported that Ukrainian forces continue to target Russian positions on the east bank of the Dnipro River. I've seen lots of footage of um, howitzers and uh, multiple launch rocket systems and air defense systems taken out in the area. Um, and reportedly showed a Ukrainian loitering munition destroying a Russian autonomous observation post on the Novokukovka Dam. So that's there. Uh, and, and the last thing I, I'm going to talk about is just really quickly uh, a couple of bits in at the end of their report from the ISW. So the Ukrainian main general intelligence director at GUI representative Skibitsky stated on February the 12th that Russia will postpone a second wave of mobilization as Russia is still experiencing difficulties with the first wave. I, I've not actually heard that yet. So that that's quite interesting. I'm going to have to look into that because obviously there's all these this big talk about a second wave because... They're going to need personnel, given that that they're struggling to to produce enough people for a, a huge offensive, as far as I can tell. Um, and this is always assumed there would be this second wave going on. But if they've postponed it, I don't know what that says. Uh, and then lastly, Wagner Group mercenaries are continuing to suffer high casualties as a result of costly operations in eastern Ukraine. Two Wagner fighters and ex-convicts told CNN that their units sustained serious losses in first wave style assaults. One soldier claimed that 60 of 90 personnel in his unit died in an assault on Bilirif near Bilirivka. 60 out of 90. That's just phenomenal. And observed that Wagner Command would commit another unit to sustain the attack despite heavy casualties. Another Wagner soldier also claimed that Wagner commanders threatened to kill retreating soldiers and would not evacuate wounded personnel from the battlefield. And they, these are consistent with previous observations. Now, that's very interesting. We There's another uh, bit of footage. I've not watched it. I don't want to watch it of another Wagner um, personnel, another Wagner member being sledgehammered to death, uh, showing as a kind of sign to the rest of Wagner, you know, this is what happens if you, if you desert or refuse. Um, and so, you know, it's about... All these bits, the, all these jigsaw pieces, like I was talking about earlier, coming together to form a picture. And is that picture accurate? We keep hearing thing, things that, that point towards the, the, the loss figures that the Ukrainians produce of the Russians on a daily basis being fairly accurate. Uh, and this this kind of builds into that. Um, anyway, that, that's a bit, of course, that's not to say that the Ukrainians aren't suffering hugely as well, that there aren't, you know, drone attacks, although... By all accounts, there are fewer drone um, of these kind of IEDs from, from dropped from drones uh, attacks happening on uh, Ukrainians. Uh, that's according to first-hand reports, uh, and I'll play you some of that in the extra later today. Um, but there, there is still, you know, loitering munitions are a problem, Lancet drones are a problem. Uh, but I just, yeah, I want to, want you to be aware that there will be footage or from. Russian sources of, of you know, problems happening behind Ukrainian lines as well, of course. Um, anyway, that's my frontline update. Please like, subscribe and share. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. All the ways you can support me are in the description below. Uh, toodle pips and I'll try and speak to you later.